Welcome to the Jay Martin Show. If you are new to the show, my name is Jay. I'm an investor looking for the smartest home for my cash. If that sounds like you, I think you're going to like what we do here. My guest today is Dave Collum. He's been on my show many times, always a crowd favorite, definitely controversial. Today, he comes out swinging, pulling on triggers and trying to rile people up as always. Before we jump in, I got a special announcement in response to the hundreds of requests and questions I've gotten from subscribers, from viewers, and from conference attendees over the last 18 months. We have produced a 10 chapter video course called The Commodity University. This is for any investors who are beginning to build a portfolio in the commodity sector or want to understand it from the ground up. We begin with the absolute fundamentals. This really is a commodity investors 101, 101. So go to thecommodityuniversity.com to check that out. I love this course. I'm really proud of it. I know you're going to like it too. Here is Dave Collum. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am with lifelong Democrat and climate activist, Dave Collum. Dave, it's great to have you back on the program. <laughs> Looking forward uh, I to didn't know I didn't know I was on the comedy channel. Okay, that's good. <laughs> well, you, you recently tweeted something kind of along those lines where you said, I've recently discovered, I'm paraphrasing, that every organization is in fact a front for the CIA. Uh, yeah. Expand on that sentiment obviously you know there's a bit of play there but expand on that for me but not much um <laughs> the more you read about the interaction between the cia and organized crime and things like that the more you you realize is that they have tentacles that stick into everything and i i i, I have this sort of working model where where once there's a certain quantity of money involved those tentacles get in there and and they start they start working. And so you, you discover, for example, that the clown who is in charge of AMBAP, who's the, you know, the, the, it's the company that put out, puts out Bud Light. Yeah. And then they, they, they blew that whole, you know, transgender thing, right. Lost $28 billion or something. You find that that CEO is um, ex CIA. So then the question is, is, is his primary job to be CEO of, of AMBAV or is his primary job to be CIA? Because I don't think CIA guys quit. I think they get reassigned. And, and you start finding those sorts of connections. So as you dig back historically, yeah, Operation Gladio, back to that. Bill Casey, former head of the CIA, was running an operation in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. And the idea was to find South a South Vietnamese sympathizers who were sympathizing with the, the North Vietnamese. And they estimate that his organization, which whacked people, took out 40,000. And I'm going, you know, that that's so savage. I mean, that that's just so outside the Overton window of a modern American. That, that some right. guy could literally be assassinating 40,000 people because they sympathize. Now, here's what I'll tell you. If I was a South Vietnamese, who would I side with? Americans on the other side of the globe or <laughs> North Vietnamese who are my neighbors, right? That this would, this could get pretty weird pretty fast, right? And, and so I could imagine myself being one of those who gets whacked. And, and Russell Brand's oh, yeah. story this month, right? The Russell yeah. Brand story. So he goes on Bill Maher and says that the vaccine's crap, right? And 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 it was brutally well done. I, did you actually see the clip? He 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 goes on Bill Maher and he says, "Bill, yeah. I brought some I brought some facts with me, you know." Yeah, and, yeah. and then he rattles them off. And next thing you know, phantom sexual sexually abused people from his distant past are supposedly accusing him of misbehaving, which I think he was proud of misbehaving, but not unconsensually. Yeah. The next thing you know, he's being demonetized from every platform and there's been no trial. There's been no, it's just, it's this fake story. Best I can tell it's a fake story. And, and so we're, we are doing the equivalent of, you know, whacking people. We're trying to whack Trump. We're trying to whack Russell Brand for taking on Pfizer. And uh, and it, it's starting to look like past eras. 
to me. It's starting to this idea that, that everything's by a set of rules. And if you if the rules are in your favor, you're going to be OK in the end. And yeah. I happen to notice the other day that the guys who were accused of trying to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, the, 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 the Democratic uh, uh, governor of Michigan. OK, so that story was ridiculous from the start because there's something like 15 conspirators of which 12 were FBI. At some point, the entrapment argument has to kick in when 12 of your 15 buddies are FBI and then they accuse the other three. And they basically said, we're just sitting around shooting the breeze, right? We're just talking about how cool it would be. And when you got 12 FBI guys trying to get you to do it and they're your peer group, you know, they can suck you in. So they came up for trial and their lives have been ruined, right? You know, you don't go through something like that without coming out the other side permanently damaged, right? You yeah. know, and yeah. and they all got acquitted on every count. Which means, therefore, that probably the prosecutor and the DA and the various people should be brought up on some treason charge, in my opinion. Sure. Because it because it, it does not sound like it was even remotely about breaking the law it was it was just a january 6 2.0 sort of move and you look at january 6 right where are the tapes why is mccarthy not giving up the tapes there's guys in jail uh some guy got 22 years in prison who wasn't even there no one you know when you have let's call it an insurrection for laughs when you have an i I wrote a lot about this a couple years ago when you have an insurrection and you don't bring guns you don't bring weapons it's been downgraded to it at worst a mob and a protest, right? Let's just take it down to the protest level. If I were a lawyer and there were actually rules to follow, which as I'm saying, I don't believe there are anymore. Um, turns out your brain chemistry changes when you're in a mob. It's well documented apparently. And you know, your neurotransmitters start firing like crazy. So, so an actual crime committed in a mob situation could be defended as a temporary insanity charge. And so the fact that people do commit crimes during mobs, that should at least be kind of considered, in my opinion, because mobs do do stupid things. And so you got this mob and it wasn't a proud day in American history, but I'll take January 6th over everything that happened after January 6th any day. So January 6th was nothing compared to the disgusting performance of the United States post January 6th. So if I could like, I want to try to recap some of what you've shared here and, and, and process it, but, you know, I think on the back of the Twitter files and frankly, a few pieces of content that have come out in the last 18 months from figureheads inside big tech, it's common knowledge that there's a lot of communication and coordination between some of those agencies like the CIA and the FBI and companies like Meta, companies like Twitter, companies like Google. And this coordination kind of like supports an idea I've been thinking about a lot over the last two years. I just refer to it as digital governments, right? These are kind of the new- Excellent term. We're sort of there, right? Companies like Meta have defense defense budgets that um, are larger than a lot of sovereign nations. They have treasuries that outpower a lot of sovereign nations. They're very powerful, very influential. They have more data than any government in the world. So their ability to move the masses is is strong. And then you have a character like Russell Brand who comes out and speaking counter narrative um, prior to any sort of trial. Uh, You know, we haven't locked him up and taken away his freedom. But what we can do with the coordination of these agencies and the big tech is we can uh, remove his income, right? We can. Well, that, that, to- I would say that takes away his freedom. We haven't incarcerated him. No, we haven't incarcerated him, but we've removed his income. Now, we, you know, maybe which is freedom, which is freedom, hundred percent. Now you could say, oh, he's super wealthy; it doesn't matter. That's beside the point. That's a that's an abstraction, right? The point here is that we've removed someone's ability to provide for themselves based on speculation, or I guess based on opinion, right? Have I captured that thread? Like, are you aligned yes. with that? Yeah. Yes, yeah. totally. Um, when the internet went live, um, we I've always said the internet was democracy's greatest hope and greatest risk. And and so I, I've, I've for quite a few years now thought that it's a battle for the internet. 
And we, you and I can talk, right? We can exchange ideas. We go on Twitter and especially with Elon now owning it, we have more access to controversial ideas and exchange them and stuff like that. So that's the greatest uh, hope. That's where the, the masses can talk. On the other hand, you, you've got these digital, uh, I would call them fascists, because when you start mixing government and corporate world together, you end up with fascism, right? That's, that's centralizing everything, that's centralizing power way too much. Um, I have wondered, wondered, yeah, so 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 I've I've thought about economics. I'm giving a talk next week on um, a case for a twenty multi-decade bear market. I'm going to make the case for a multi-decade bear market, and the 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 super stock leaders of the market, the ones that have elevated the market, are all the companies I consider kind of crappy companies. You know, if Facebook went away today, would you care? Would I care? No. Does it create wealth the way John D. Rockefeller did? Does it create wealth the way General Motors did? No. Um, Tesla has half the market cap of all the car dealers in the country, yet it's yet it doesn't make all the cars. That's for sure. Um, you know, Nvidia getting all the press trading at forty-seven times revenues, right? Uh, Sun Microsystems trading at ten times revenues before it did a ninety-eight percent swan dive. So, so these are crappy companies that are elevating the markets. I've wondered if the so-called missing uh, Pentagon money, trillions, they say, oh, what do you mean, really? How do you know that? Well, actually, Donald Rumsfeld admitted they were missing 2.7 trillion. And that announcement was made on September 10th, 2001. What an odd bit of timing to admit the Pentagon is missing $2.7 trillion. And and somehow the next day that all became irrelevant and went back into the backdrop. It's almost like Donald knew something that we didn't know at the time. Um, so let's say the Pentagon is now missing 10. I think if you ask Catherine Austin Fitz, who I, I'm tempted to ask again, how much she thinks is missing via the Pentagon, that might be 10 trillion. Those 10 trillion could be all the profits of Google, Facebook, NVIDIA, Right. That, that they could be those companies could actually not be profitable if they weren't part of this deep state. I, I don't know where their money comes from, for sure. It's possible there's people who do and they're going, no, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. I will concede that point. But I worry if this Pentagon is spending 10 trillion dollars on, on stuff that that's behind the scenes, someone's getting that money. And it's well, not you know, just Zelensky, right? And it's not just Zelensky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you touch on a, an interesting concept because when I am helping a company raise money, if it's a substantial right. amount of cash, we will often fight for influence, oversight of that capital. We don't just want to let some entrepreneur go and have a complete adventure with our money. And so we'll position board seats, uh, voting shares, all of this stuff to make sure we have influence right. over the direction of the, com of the company. Um if you look at the the projected influence and growth of a lot of these major tech companies and their continuous need to go back to the market for capital, it's it's logical that government would want uh, a horse in that race and a seat at that table. And so providing cash through um, maybe white labeled VC firms in order to get board seats on those comp like within those companies, Mm -hmm. It just seems like common sense to me, to be honest, if if I were in the seat of, of big government and looking at the innovative companies coming out of my country and their consistent need for capital, my ability to create that capital, my ability to provide that capital in exchange for influence over those companies and access to their data gathering capabilities, et cetera. It doesn't seem conspiracy to me. It kind of seems like, well, obviously, obviously, right? It's sort of logical that that would occur. Do you think so? Well, by definition, yeah, writing blank checks doesn't seem logical. Um, I, I read somewhere, and I don't know if this is true. It is coming off the Internet, of course. Um, I read somewhere that, that China owns 26% of Silicon Valley. I, I don't know what that means. I don't I know. know if that number is preposterous. I, I don't know what yeah. to do with that number. What I do know is is that if true, then then we have a problem. Um yeah, Israel owns some percentage of Silicon Valley. You don't have to be you don't have to be an anti-Semite, which I'm pretty sure I'm not, 
to, to sit there and wonder if it's in our best interest to have Israel having so many tentacles into Silicon Valley because they are a sovereign state that does not necessarily have a perfect Venn diagram overlap with the United States interests. And, and you know, our voting machines, I once tracked down the Dominion story, which in itself is a story of phenomenal corruption. Um, Dominion turns out when you connect all the pieces is owned by a company in Beijing. So they own our voting machines. So if you really want to make the case that the voting's legit, which is a case that I would happily take the other side of, um, you, you got to ask why is China own our voting machines and stuff like that. And own, own, you're not going to, you're not going to uh, own, oh, own, okay, okay, own. So Dominion is owned by supposedly by a subsidiary of 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 UBS which the major owner of that is a, a company in Beijing. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a daisy chain sh series of shell companies. I went and looked at Dominion. This is actually an entertaining story. So when Dominion sued Fox for $700 million, um, um, and I'm thinking, why did Fox settle? In any other era of the past, this would have had to the Supreme Court. Fox would have said, we're journalists. They can't sue us. The Supreme Court would have said, yes, you have, you have, you have all sorts of constitutional protections. And that never would have happened, right? They never would have been able to sue Fox. All of a sudden, Fox settles for 100 million. You go, what's that all about? And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, Tucker gets fired. They go, okay, those two are connected. And then I dug around and found that Dominion's annual revenues are, uh, uh, first of all, I went to see what happened to Dominion stock because I said, you know, 700 million, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good score for a company. What did that do to their share price, right? And it turns out they had gone private in 2018. I go, oh, that's a convenient time to go private, right? Right before the 2020 elections, when the guy who everyone on the planet seemed to want to get out of office was going to be coming up for re-election. And so, so it took it all off the radar of everybody. And then I found some documents that showed some redactions in them, which, which they didn't explain why they were redacted, but it always made me a little nervous when there was this blurry part that you can't see. But I picked up their revenues. It was about 17 million, 18 million a year. So Fox settled damages for 10 times annual revenues, right? I mean, that's, 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 uh, uh, ten, excuse me, excuse me. No, if you assume that Dominion's worth five times revenue, sorry, let me get this right. If you assume Dominion's worth about five times revenues, which is probably an okay round number estimate, then, uh, then Fox settled for, uh, on a damage suit for 10 times the value of the entire company. Seems like an awfully big damage suit to me. Seems like you'd negotiate that one down now. My suspicion is no money changed hands. My suspicion is Fox wanted Tucker out. They needed a headline to get him out. Dominion said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Everyone wins except for Tucker. Tucker actually won. I was watching Tucker before he got fired and he was touching the third rail with such aggression that I, I've had the suspicion that Tucker was trying to get fired the whole way that he was trying to get himself booted because if he didn't get fired, he had sort of Fox based gag order. If he could get fired, then he could go out on his own and tell the story, tell the stories he's telling and he's that, getting paid. Do you think Tucker has political ambitions in his future? I wouldn't be shocked. He would be one of the down ticket guys that I would think, um, I would think would be potentially on people's lips. So on a Republican ticket, McGregor, Flynn, Carlson, Gabbard. Um, and there's a couple more I'm not thinking of, but you get the idea. Okay. So flipping over to uh, flipping over to the markets a little bit, you, you touched on the, you know, just the elevated prices of a lot of these companies, logical valuations, all this stuff, um, how consolidated the market is and so few names, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm I'm really struggling to see a couple things right now. How? So I I think it's likely that rolls off real hard this winter. And the reason I think it could roll off real hard this winter is because of how many people are going to be squeezed on liquidity this winter. Um, the metrics I look at would be like delinquent credit card payments, delinquent auto loan payments, new credit card application rejection rates hitting all time highs, 
People can't afford their monthly payments anymore. They're reaching out for new credit. They're no longer getting they're it. Desperate. They're, they're desperate. They're desperate. They're desperate. Exactly. Yeah, you know, there's a large population that are going to be restarting student loans very soon. Uh, those are huge balances. Those are huge balances. And um, we're tight today. Now you look at the oil market and the direction it's going, right? Oil's climbing back up. Um, U.S. production is rolling over. Uh, you know, the the I think the only significant growth in production over the last 12 years outside of OPEC has been unconventional shale in the U.S., led by right. the Permian Basin, which is now producing less month over month, um, every single month. Now, most citizens probably don't read the EIA inventory reports that would show you that U.S. is producing less each month, but I guarantee you the Saudis and the Russians do. And the fact that they've extended their production cuts into the new year doesn't strike me as a coincidence. Simultaneously, right. last week, Russia announced a, a limit on export of diesel, which we can already hardly produce enough of. And anyways, you know, the point is, Energy is being weaponized. The price is going to go up. Diesel's already at all-time highs for this time of year, and it's up 60% since the summer in Europe. If the price of diesel goes up, if the price of energy goes up, the price of everything goes up. It's the universal input to everything that you need. If you have to grow it, manufacture it, or move it, guess what? It's all it's energy. Good. It's just energy. Yes, 100%. Um, and this setup, I, I don't see a way. And you know, if energy prices rise, it takes a few months for those prices to hit the shelf because you got to fuel the factory, fuel the fuel the tanker, whatever. But eventually, you get hit with those prices, price increases as well. Um, and that squeeze, like people will look for liquidity at any price. They'll look for liquidity wherever they can get it. And a lot of people have a lot locked up in those markets right now. And that you know could be the trigger point that causes a massive sell off this winter. But you know, I'm quite concerned, Dave, about rising inflation near term, people's inability to deal with it and how flat-footed most are going to get caught. Um, I try not to be a pessimist with a, with a pessimistic outlook, but near term, that's that's what I see. And I don't see any way that it works out differently. But what do you think about that? Well, you and I are very complimentary because I don't look at near term, I look at long term and I'm, a, I'm having trouble being optimistic long term. So I've got the markets, crudely speaking, at about 120 to 150 percent overvaluation, overvalued based on historical metrics. I believe that valuation is a the most mean regressing metric in all of Wall Street. So at some point, stocks get real expensive. They then eventually become real cheap, and then they eventually become real expensive. And there are metrics for valuation. Unlike many things, valuation is, is the price divided by things that the price ought to correlate with. So they're very straightforward metrics. I keep track of about 25. They all give the same answer, basically. And um, so we're sitting here at record valuations. We're, we're, we're to, to correct if, through a straight down drop would take about a 60 or 70% correction. I've done uh, the math. It turns out that if you just tread water and the markets don't move on an inflation adjusted basis and you wait for the GDP to just kind of grow its way underneath these valuations, it takes about 35 years. And so you want to take off some of the froth and grow the market. You can, you can drop the markets inflation adjusted about, I don't know, 20 percent over 25 years. And so time is the variable that people have forgotten about. So I don't pay attention to sentiment indicators because they're all short term. And I just look and, and there are periods in the U.S. history where the markets went from a price to an inflation adjusted price that's identical between 40 and 70 years later. And no one knows that. I've been very, very few people know that. They always focus on, oh, when's it going to recover? Rebounces are popular. Right. From 1906 to 1981, the price of, of the S&P didn't move. Inflation adjusted. All you got were dividends. All you got were dividends. Right, right. From 1929, same thing, 1981. So the 81 low represents the peak for a whole bunch of the peaks all throughout the century. So right now, we're at this monstrous peak. And there will be some low way, way, way out in the future it's at exactly the same price. Now, if you're a trader and you're not, a, you know, buy low, sell high, that's great. Except for the fact that what do we all get told? We get told to just buy and hold. Yeah. Which is saying, don't trade. Don't trade. We've got a demographic problem in 1980. The 
demographics were phenomenal. The boomers entered the workplace. They brought their wives for the first time. The Russians started selling cheap energy because the Soviet Union was starting to collapse. It was struggling. So they just started selling as much oil, letting us help them sell oil and resources. China started selling labor at a ridiculously low price. So 40 years ago, the beginning of a great run. So to me, recency bias is 40 years. And back then, 40 years, the market was sitting with valuations at record low. Let's call it a PE of six. It's now Schiller PE is 30. So we got a five-fold gain in valuation. So, so there's all the, the interest rates were 15%. They got as low as one on a 30-year treasury in the ones. They had a one handle. And, and if you read the Buffett 1999, I think it was Fortune article, he said, that's the whole story. He said, when rates are going up over the long term, you get a bear market. When rates are going down over the long term, you get a bull market, period. Well, we went from 15 to one over 40 years. So then the question is, what happens if over the next 40 years, we don't have this tailwind from the Ruskies. We don't have a tailwind from China delivering huge volumes of labor. We don't have a demographic tailwind. We don't have an interest rate tailwind. So what happened from 1981 to the present over 40 years, the market valuation, not the price, the valuation, the thing that ought to just flutter around, grew, annualized at over 3% a year. It compounded the valuation at 3% a year. What happens if the next um, 40 years is compounding negative 3%, which it will, because mean regression means that. We're going to have real cheap stocks yeah. somewhere in the future. That's a 6% swing that will be an uninvestable market. It might be tradable, but it's going to be uninvestable. And, and, and then during that period, Domestic politics was quiet. From uh, I, Those of us who lived through the 60s and 70s were stunned when the 80, 80s showed up. And all of a sudden, you know, kids were no longer just wanting to get stoned. And, and, and they started getting serious. And, 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 and the civil rights problems had, had dialed way back. And so from 1980 to the present, domestically, our politics was pretty calm. Uh, international politics was pretty calm, provided you weren't on the receiving end of the U.S. industrial military complex where we bombed the living crap out of you. But from Joe Sixpack's perspective, international politics was tame. From Iraq's perspective, they lost a lot of people. From the Middle East perspective, they lost an estimated four million. So, so I, I hesitate to say international politics was tame, but it was tame for U.S. investors. North yeah. American investors. And so none of that looks repeatable to me. Our domestic politics looks pretty awful and maybe for quite a while. Our international politics is looking pretty awful and maybe for quite a while. We've got bad demographics, according to Peter Zihan. I think he's right. I think there's problems. We've talked about Zihan. I think there's problems with some of what he says, but I think generally he has a right. Um, and so everything looks like it's on the downslope to me, a 40 year reversal. And so I think we're heading for a tough spot. And I think we'll, you know, you'll be an old man and I'll be a dead man. And uh, if, if it takes 40 years to get back to that, that, that low, that, 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 uh, that beginning of green shoots, right? Sure, then, sure. There'll be, high, there'll be highs and lows. It's not to say there won't be tradable highs and disastrous lows and things like that. But I think 40 years from now, the markets will have moved almost nowhere. Well, that will be consistent in terms of 40 year trends. You know, you walk just through sort of 1980 to 2020, you can go back to the previous 40 years and find the same cycle from more or less 1940 to 1980. Um, you know, rates climbed, right? It, it was a general. Well, the interesting cycle. thing, I just happened to be reading Russell Napier this morning, and Russell was talking about financial repression post war. And he was talking about how. He's talking about how this could look a lot like post-war U.S. markets. But but and I'm thinking, wait a minute, you're forgetting something. And then he did not forget it. And he said, but the markets were dirt cheap. So we started the post-war period up to 67 when problems began. Right. So if you own the markets in 67 and wrote them out till 81, you got crushed. You got crushed. You lost 75 percent inflation adjusted. 
over 14 years. Most of us, 14 years is a big percentage of our investment cycle. Yeah. Right. That, that's a killer. I remember my dad suffering through that. And he was a fairly affluent guy. And he's talking about, I don't know if I'm ever going to retire. And I'm going, if this guy can't retire, I don't know who can. And yeah, so, sure. um, so Russell pointed out that the valuations were dirt. And now they're very high. You got uh, Edward Chancellor, who's the god of past booms, right? The expert of boom bust cycles. And he said that every time rates get down to 2%, there's a crisis. And I don't think he just means like you know, a bear market. I'm t- he's talking crisis, right? Great Depression crisis. And rates got negative. Yeah. And so I think Edward Chancellor probably is losing a lot of sleep lately. Okay. So let me let me ask you a question based off of this, Dave. So uh, thinking through this 40-year cycle scenario, moving back 40 years, um, you know, rates were super high, markets are super low. Um Politics became kind of boring, but they came kind of boring on the back of politics being very exciting, right? The 60s and 70s were a different scenario. You know, in the 60s and 70s, you could say U.S. was caught up in a ton of bad wars that it shouldn't have been in. Internal conflict was running extraordinarily high. I mean, compared to today, you could say, oh, tensions are super high right now internally. And it's like, well, I don't know. Back then, presidents were getting assassinated. Like, it's all relative, you know? And right. um, you could say it was worse then than it is today. Was there an external adversary as there is today in China back then? Yeah, there was, right? A big one. Always. The Soviets. Yeah. The Soviets. Right? Yeah. So there's a lot of parallels to that era into today. My question would be though, so so you could you could take that and say we've been through this before, right? Right. America prevails, strongest economy in the world. You know, we've seen this movie before. And it's actually not as bad as it was back then. Maybe some, some aspects are different, but some aren't as bad. Having said that, then you step back further and look at the bigger arc of history and say, well, in the last 600 years, we've experienced five global empires, right? With the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the British, and now the American empire squeezed into they that. They eventually end. They, they end. all do. And I guarantee you the citizens <laughs> of those empires would never acknowledge that during their reign, right? And so right. stepping back from that standpoint, you know, taking the long-term view, is that what we're looking at now? Is this, are we playing our way out? And that could be a 40 year process. Don't get me wrong, but are we playing our way out? I, I, I almost think we'd be lucky if we did a British empire version. Now the problem is the British empire was wiped out by two world wars, right? So, yes. so they were, they were an empire and then they fought world war one and then they sort of stumbled back on their feet. And then they fought world war two. Um, I actually was a copy editor of the battle of Bretton woods. Um, I read that book carefully because I was copy editing it for uh, Ben Steele. Um, we bet Brit- Britain over a barrel to, in our Lend-Lease program to help them during the war. The, the, the narrative is always, oh, they were just our buddies. We just gave them everything we could until we got into the war. The, that's not what we did. We t- completely raped and pillaged them such that when the war was over, they would not be an empire. We ensured that the way we set up the Lend-Lease program. So, so, uh, so that was a, in some level, a tame end of an empire, right? It wasn't a total collapse. It was just kind of an erosion back to being kind of generically mediocre. Um, I think we might be so lucky to do that. But again, we come back to this. We're in a period now where we're weaponizing the Department of Justice. There's things that are really troubling here. And 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 the digital world is making it so complicated to understand how. So I think we're going to have to push. We're going to have to go into the valley of death, in my opinion, is the way I like to phrase it. I think to be okay, we have to push through it. Right? We're not going to avoid it. We're going to go through it, and we have to just sort of fight our way through it and come out the other side, and hope to find green shoots and you know, sort of a new way of looking at the world and, 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 and correct our mistakes and move on. And I think we do have, you know, we have resources, we have a lot of land. Um, we have a decreasingly educated population, but still a pretty good one. Um, if they, if whoever's doing this, and I believe someone's doing it, if, uh, I, the forces against the United States in the world right now appear to be attempting to destroy the middle class to me. So I, th- I think, I think if you, if there's globalists, right? You go, of course there's globalists, but they've never been so outspoken. 
right? Yeah, the Club of Rome kind of doing its thing and stuff like that. But the globalists now talk about globalism like that's their goal. And you say, who stands between the globalists and their goal? And these are these are also neo-Marxists, right? These are these are guys who really think, oh, we'll get this whole Marxism thing right finally. Um, and who stands between them are nationalists, right? And so, who are the nationalists? Well, Putin, Trump, United States, in more general sense. And so, the thing the United States has that has been unique is a strong middle class. This 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 salt of the earth type person who who knew how to bang it out and and who was tough and and a lot of grit and and um, and and now you look at all these things that are happening and they all look like they're designed to erode the the social fabric of that middle class. So you lock down churches. And I'm I'm an atheist. I'm not an atheist. I, atheist is way too strong. I'm personally not interested in religion for myself. I've come to realize that it's very important for society. I'm just let, happy to let other people do it. Um, yeah. And and so, you know, I remember when they first started taking Christmas out of schools. And I'm, a little voice in my head said, why? You know, kids love it, right? This makes, this is a little quiet. And, and, and everything has turned into this war, this class warfare. And I, it feels to me like it's astroturfed. It feels to me like there's 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 a deep, deep, strong gravitational pull that is tugging at the middle class and trying to get it to self-destruct. And I just listened to Camille Paglia, but I've heard it from other sources about how empires that are ending, one of the common denominators is they start questioning gender. That's really it's like holy moly, really. And so apparently that's true. Apparently uh, the, you, you, the the sort of the basic principles that you lived by start getting eroded. And sure. One of them is questioning reality, right? When let's take it away from gender, questioning reality, right? Just say uh, gaslighting, right? The gaslighting picks up. I publish a weekly newsletter every Sunday. If you would like to subscribe hit the link right beneath this video. Now I'm an investor, but I don't write about managing money. I write about managing my mind. Without question, the hardest and most important part of allocating capital through volatility and getting some back. If you wanna read my newsletter, hit the link right beneath this video. I know you'll love it. Now back to the interview, enjoy. Okay, I wanna dive back to one other thing you said earlier about sort of the relationship between gender confusion and the end of empire. I think you sort of touched on that as a trend that emerges, you know, on, on the right. downstroke. And I look at like the woke wave and, and all of this with a very serious critical eye because I have three young boys and uh, I'm very concerned about this. I also wonder if this is a movie that we've seen before. Now, you know, you look at a lot of the, uh, the endless... Uh, creation of pronouns. You look at statements like gender is a social construct and all this stuff. And to me, it's like, it's pretty horrifying. Having said that, if I were to think through and try to put myself in the mindset of somebody who was say born in 1920 and they were raised during the great depression, right after that, they were shipped off to war and fought brutal trench warfare, saw friends and family die, horrific scenes and all of this they come back to the United States and now they're 40 years old and it's the sixties and they're watching the next generation and they're watching, you know, uh, call it abuse of psychedelics. I probably wouldn't use the word abuse to be honest, but you know, expiration. But, but in their eyes, it was, in their absolutely eyes, it was. Absolutely. It was absolutely. Right. It was definitely rebelling against the establishment you could interpret that as a complete lack of accountability and responsibility and appreciation for your life and what it took to build your life. And, you know, um, and, uh, you know, the, the free love and sex and, you know, all of it, right? Like you could draw some parallels and put yourself in the mindset of that individual who was born, grew up in the, in the depression, you know, fought in the second world war, um, you know, and then came back to the U S and like, what the hell happened here? Right. This is, as polar opposite as I could imagine, and none of this makes sense. And I wonder if it's that different from how I'm looking at woke culture today being like, there's like conventions of people that identify as dogs. This is ridiculous and none of it makes sense. 
to me, right? Have we seen this movie well, before? So I like, think I think kids naturally rebel against whatever they were raised, and then they probably retain it later. One time my son, when he was around 10, said, Dad, I find myself saying the same shit you say. And I said, apparently. Um, and, and, and so they do hear you. So keep talking to them. They might not look like they hear you, but you got to keep talking to them. <laughs> I think... You know, when I was a kid, if you wore your hat backwards, you like came from Andy of Mayberry and you were an idiot. You were the town moron. Right. So you'd never wear your hat backwards. And so so our kids started wearing their hat backwards. Uh Right. And, And we wanted our hair long, supposedly. And therefore, the kids want to shave their heads. Uh-huh. And 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 our parents had tattoos and therefore we wouldn't touch tattoos. But now our kids get tattoos. Right. So there's a natural oscillation here. Yeah. Um, this has got the natural oscillation also fits pretty nicely under the idea of the fourth turning where the oscillation occurs. And in, in, in one of the four big oscillations is a bad one. And the last of the the last fourth turning, you know, was was back in the, the 30s and the 40s. And then uh, when the world was in complete upheaval and then, you know, uh, uh, how and Stra- Strauss and how um, predicted the next fourth turning would arrive around 2010. And, and all of a sudden we have the financial crisis, which to me was not the start of the fourth turning. If, if you, if I were to put a, a start of a fourth turning on it, I would say it was the poor response to the financial crisis. And that is we not we not only bailed out the banks, which you could make a pragmatic argument in favor of, but we didn't make any of them pay for any of their misdeeds. Yeah. And yeah. that left a, such a terrible taste in people's mouths. It's still present. Right. That was that was the end of uh, of an era. Where people were believers and now we've got um, we've got the vaccine story, which some people still believe. But most of us are going. These guys look like a bunch of neo-Nazis to me now. Um, it looks like they caused the, the goddamn pandemic. It looks like they caused the overreaction to it. It looks like they 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 used incredibly authoritarian methods to control the, the information flow. And so we don't trust at all. Um, we don't trust the Department of Justice now, most of us, I think. I did a poll on the FBI and got like a 95% distrust count. And we're over in Ukraine, and I think most people are looking at Ukraine going, you know, okay, Russia invaded Ukraine. I've actually written extensively about it, and I have actually defended Putin's move into Ukraine. That's a very unpopular stance, I should add. Sure. Um, I think Putin got forced into moving into Ukraine, and so he, he went. And uh, and I can make the case. I made the case, I think, and I think it's holding up well. Okay, let, but, me, let me, sorry, unless I'm cutting you off on a, on a good thread there. No, right? no, go ahead, go ahead. On that, here's maybe just to expand on that point. How much, how, what, is it so challenging? How much of America's perception of that war is grounded in the fact that Americans and Canadians tend to think about history in like the span of a couple hundred years? Because that's the history that our countries have existed. Whereas if you look at a country like Russia, you got to go back 2000 years, right? And I may have this wrong. The audience will let me know. But was Kiev not <laughs> capital of the state of Russia? Uh, I think Russia, I think Ukraine and Russia merged in 1667 or something. I mean, it, it was really so. So one of the most instructive things is to get one of those dynamic maps that shows borders changing over two millennia, something like that, or one millennia, but, but, but a very long time. And what you realize is that Europe is this gigantic series of tribes in which the borders are just constantly breathing and shifting and doing whatever. So 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 I think at the time when Russia moved into Ukraine and what people don't seem to understand, this is what bothers me so much. They somehow think that our news is telling us the truth and everything Russia says is is propaganda. Our propaganda machine is bigger than Russia's GDP. I mean, it, it is an unbelievable machine. And so I was watching the Ukraine war going. I'm not seeing Putin trying to kill a lot of people. I'm not seeing him destroying infrastructure. I'm seeing him what looks like what we would call a uh, um, um, uh, uh, sort of a military movement. 
and and it looked to me like he was, you know, sort of throwing a fastball past the chin of Ukraine to me and saying, you know, you, you guys can't do this. He tried to warn us for, for years. Look, you can't have Ukraine. You just to NATO. He said you can't have Ukraine. And at some point we decided we were going to take Ukraine no matter what. Now, dial forward a year from when I last wrote about it. Um, there's now an estimated 400,000 dead Ukrainians. Those 400,000 guys, I wouldn't be surprised if they had a say, would not think they died for the right cause because I, I don't think there's any evidence that whether the border puts it as part of Russia or whether it puts it as part of Ukraine, I, I, it, it's just an abstraction, right? And by the way, Putin wasn't trying to take over Ukraine. Putin was trying to get control of, of Eastern Ukraine, where the Donbass region, where ethnic Russians were hanging out, were getting slaughtered, by the way. And so the, I, it's pretty e it was pretty easy to make a case that Russia was forced into it. And, the, and NATO wanted him to take the bait. He took the bait. And he made several mistakes. One is he thought he could go in with a weak force and that somehow the Ukrainians would say, OK, OK, this sucks. We'll will agree to not do something. And 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 I think he underestimated NATO's willingness to let Ukrainians get slaughtered by the hundreds of thousands. And that's what we've done. So we keep arming the Ukrainians to go into the meat grinder to get killed. And now these guys have you know, five weeks of training. And then when they send them out on the front lines, yeah. And they're all dying. They're just all dying. It's an 80% debilitation rate, right? Debilitation meaning either wounded to the point of having to go home or dead. And we send over, you know, 30 Abrams tanks. That takes 30 shells on the part of Russia to take out those 30 Abrams tanks. So it's just a symbolic gesture. And 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 meanwhile, the Ukrainians are dying. The children are disappearing. The economy is being destroyed because Putin tried not to destroy the infrastructure because he didn't want to have to rebuild it. Right. That would be stupid. Sure. And and then all of a sudden we take out the Nord Stream pipeline and the Chechen bridge is oh, shit just got real, apparently. So now he's kicking the crap out of them. Yeah. And that's what you would predict. And so. Victoria Newland should be strung from the neck until dead, in my opinion. I think she's treasonous piece of crap. Um, I, I, I don't think I don't think we're on the right side of history on this one at all. Uh, and, and, you know, George Kennan, who's one of the famous Cold Warriors, this is one of these guys. You wouldn't call him a wuss. This guy was battling in the Soviet Union all through his career as a Cold Warrior. When we moved eastward, when NATO moved eastward in 1997, Cannon said that was the biggest foreign policy disaster in our history. He thought moving eastward with NATO was the, was a, a disastrous move because we had agreed with the Ruskies. They don't move the Warsaw Pact west. We don't move NATO east. Kind of a buffer zone. Yep. Both leave it alone. And Russia didn't break that promise. NATO did. And we promised them shit. We didn't get a signet. We didn't sign anything. And people say, well, where's the signature? Where? And if you talk to John Mearsheimer, who I have, um, he'll say, look, foreign policy is done by handshakes. It's a lot of shit that goes on behind the scenes where I say, look, here's what we're going to do. Here's what you're going to do. Yep. Our news will talk about all sorts of crap that has nothing to do with reality. But here, we'll move the missiles out of Turkey, right? You, you do move the missiles out of Cuba. And if somehow a word gets out, we're moving them out of Turkey, we're going to deny it, but we'll still move them out of Turkey, right? Yeah. That's that's how for, for, diplomacy is about providing an exit ramp for your opponent. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's done unofficially, just saying, look, you're going to have to trust us. And Mearsheimer says, when foreign guys get in a back room and they talk, they don't lie to each other. They lay their cards on the table. He says, they get in front of a TV camera, lying starts right right but they know that they know that so putin cut deals and we broke them and i know there's pro-ukrainian guys listening to this who are appalled i started out not being able to pick ukraine off of maps so i started out from zero well you know and i all i would say to that is like i'm not I'm not pro anything i mean i i just i try to step back and just say what's inevitable 
right? And to an extent, the European continent continually descending into war is mm -hmm. inevitable. That's always been inevitable. I mean, it's always been the case anyways, and I don't see any reason why that's going to stop. Um, you know, it's, it's always been the case. As you mentioned, it's a collection of culturally different tribes sharing one piece of land, right? Right. Um, you know, imagine if, if uh, anyways. So, you know, that being the case, it's like there, there will always be power moves made. And, and if we're on the wrong side of history, again, I step back from that. And I'm like, well, replace us with anybody, right? It's the same game. It's the, the game of power and empire, right? And, um, you know, attaining power and then protecting it. And it's like the right side of history, wrong side of history. I don't know. It just is, you know, people just, they crave it's just power. History. It is just history, right? History. Yeah. I could imagine, I could imagine a scenario where some five-star general who has full security clearance could sit my ass down and say, okay, Dave, here, here's the chessboard. Um, there's a famous quote from Daniel Ellsberg when he was talking to Kissinger before Kissinger got the highest clearance okay. and Ellsberg had it. And he said, Henry, when you first get the security clearance, the stuff you gotta, you're going to see is going to shock you. He says, then you're going to be elated because you're going to go, wow. It's going to be like this serotonin rush. And he says, then you're going to be talking to some three-star general who's babbling on about something. And you know, he's full of crap because he doesn't know what you know. And then you're going to stop listening to people. And then you're going to blow something really badly. That's how it's going to work. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I could imagine that if I had top security clearance, which I'm pretty much the opposite end of that, um, that I could be convinced that our, what I consider really brutish global behavior is necessary. Sure. And, and Zihan makes an interesting case. You know, the world global trade depends critically on being able to send a ship, you know, 12,000 miles away without wondering if that ship's going to get sunk. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And as a consequence of that, if, if we're the only ones who can patrol the high seas, if what keeps those ships from getting sunk is to say, okay, if we sink that ship, the U.S. is going to come and bomb the living piss out of us. Then you argue that the heavy hand of the U.S. is serving an important role. And there's well, no other country that can project that kind of power globally no. right now. I mean, it's definitely serving a role. Like that. that's for certain. Right. Yeah, really. Right. And uh, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's short, history not short on just oddly cruel examples of power grabs. I mean, just look at the previous empire and the opium wars in China, right? And just right. wild, wild abuse of power um, and coercion in order to create trade in a country that didn't want what you had. So you got them hooked on heroin and then sold them whatever they needed. Right. You know, anyways, I will, uh, I will wrap this one up, Dave, and, and let you go. Uh, it's always fun catching up with you and entertaining. <laughs> And um, I'll look forward to the next time, man. I appreciate your time. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now, if you want to take the next step, I publish a weekly newsletter and it's free. There's a link to subscribe right beneath this video. And you can join me and 50,000 other investors weekly for this exclusive content where I share my key action items and takeaways from conversations just like this and plenty others. Thanks for stopping by.